South Texas, 1840. On the bank of Chicolete Creek, northeast of the town of Victoria, a large, bearded man sits alone next to a small campfire. Though the oppressive Texas sun has sunk into the horizon several hours ago, he cannot sleep. As he stares into the campfire, he wonders what is worse, to stay awake recalling the memories, or to fall asleep and relive them in his nightmares. His knuckles whiten as he grips the handle on his knife and stares intensely into the flames. On this night, like so many others, his thoughts are not here in his Spartan one-man camp that he shares only with his trusted horse, Pepperpot. They are now firmly ensconced in the memory from a few years earlier on a farmstead 60 miles away on the banks of the Guadalupe River. The man's name is Jeff Turner, and he had come to Texas from Kentucky in the 1830s. He had been born and raised in the bluegrass state and had always planned on making his way as a farmer near the place of his birth. He had married a young woman from his hometown near the Beach Fork, and within a few years, the young couple had a small but thriving farm and three young sons. Life was good. Then, one day, a stranger stopped by the Turner's family farm asking if he might trouble them for a hot meal and a night's boarding. This was not wholly uncommon in the area at the time, and he was welcomed inside for a dinner and a night's rest. As the family ate, Jeff Turner and the traveler conversed about the man's ultimate destination. The man said he was on his way south, as many in Kentucky were at the time. He was headed to a land of open, free country, with rich lands for farming and cattle, hills and valleys replete with wild game, rivers teeming with fish, all open for the taking for any settler with enough gumption and drive to do so. He was heading, the traveler said, to Texas. The next morning, the traveler had gone on his way, and the Turner family returned to their daily chores and social interactions. However, Jeff Turner could not shake the thought of Texas from his mind. Though his family had lived comfortably, they lived meagerly. And while this had sufficed for his small brood until now, there was little to no hope of amassing enough wealth to pass on to his children, nor to ensure his wife's perpetual comfort upon his passing. For months, Jeff Turner was dogged by the notion that he could and should have been doing more to provide a future for his wife and young children. Finally, he made up his mind that the Turners would sell their farm and move to Texas. It would take months more of convincing his reluctant wife that this was the right decision, as the prospect of leaving their moderate but reliable lifestyle seemed, at first, far too daunting for the young mother. After all, Texas was known for more than just its tales of prosperity and progress. Though it would soon establish itself as an independent republic which ostensibly laid claim to lands from Matagorda Bay to today's Oklahoma Panhandle, everyone knew that Texas did not really belong to the Texians. Nor had it belonged to their predecessors in the Mexican government. Nor the Mexicans' predecessors in the Spanish. Texas for the last century and a half, had belonged to the Comanche. Even for residents of Kentucky in the 1830s, the stories of the atrocities being wrought across Texas were unlike anything they had heard before. Their forefathers had long fought the resident tribes of Kentucky, like the Shawnee and the Cherokee. They had subjected and been subject to all manner of violent encounters that had seen men, women, and children on both sides needlessly slaughtered for decades, if not centuries. And still, for many, the accounts of the few who had survived a raid by the Comanches were jaw-dropping. Countless Spanish missionaries and Mexican settlers, as well as nearly every tribe who offered even the most tacit resistance or imposition, like the Tonkawa, Waco, Delaware, Kickapoo, and the Apache, had fallen victim to the merciless depredations of the Comanche. Time and again, entire families, even entire villages, had been simply wiped out. All the men would be killed, as well as any children not old or able enough 
to be self-sufficient. Women would be doomed to a life as slaves and concubines, often ultimately being killed themselves when no longer of use or interest to their masters. But despite the volume and veracity of the horrific reports that seemed to flood out of the burgeoning republic, the settlers, replete with their dreams of fortune and legacy, continued to pour into the territory. And, just as so many had done before him, in the fall after being visited by the Texas-bound traveler, Jeff Turner finally convinced his justifiably reluctant wife that the prospective risk was worth the potential reward. Turner sold the farm for a decent profit, and the young family packed everything they owned and made their way south to the Republic of Texas. After spending a few weeks near San Antonio, the family made their way to the Guadalupe River, following its southeasterly course, which ultimately ends in the Gulf of Mexico. It would be here, on a tributary likely not far from the present-day towns of Seguin and Gonzales, that Jeff Turner and his family would stake their claim. Turner, with the help of his two eldest sons, built a small cabin and in the early spring had begun to clear the brush and bramble around the family's home in order to plant crops. Though she had been reluctant to leave their Kentucky home, Mrs. Turner began to warm to the trappings of their new homestead. The stories had indeed been true. The land was rich for farming. Her husband had no trouble in keeping the family well fed on wild game, and the creek that ran nearby was both bountiful and beautiful. It seemed that, after many months, the arduous trip and countless dangers and hardships had been, in fact, worth it. The Turner family had found their home in Texas, and they were happy. Then, one morning early that May, Jeff Turner set out with his rifle on a hunt. Before he left, he took time to absorb the totality of his bucolic home front scene. His three sons, all under the age of ten, played near the stream. They used sticks to roll along waist-high hoops of wood made by tying the ends of a slender branch together. This game was common throughout European, American, and many indigenous cultures throughout the world. The game was a favorite amongst his young sons, and the unmistakable looks of carefree joy on their faces gave their father a sense of great satisfaction. On the side of the cabin, in the family's small vegetable garden, Mrs. Turner was busy pruning and pricking as she sang her favorite songs in a lovely, lilting tone. She cheerily bid her husband farewell, seemingly without breaking meter in the song that she was singing. Jeff Turner's heart was full as he ventured down the small creek and around a bend, finding himself in the middle of a timbered thicket before going much more than a mile. The day would be warm, Turner had thought, but even if there were no game about, it would be nice to take a walk and explore parts of this scenic track in more depth than he had yet done. In the silence of the early morning, the rippling of the small stream seemed to grow to a den. Then, suddenly, the tranquility of the rolling water was broken by the percussive retort of what sounded like a dozen or more rifles. And, all at once, Jeff Turner found himself awash in pure, cold terror. Visions of the worst possibilities flashed through his mind as he took off in a dead run towards his homestead. Then, seconds later, he heard the screams. They were a mix of the triumphant war cries interspersed with the shrieks of his beloved family. Before Turner reached the bend around which lie the cabin, the sound became that of only war cries. Finally coming into view of the house, Turner was met with a scene of utter devastation. He approached from the front, with the attack having come from the rear of the house. Coming through the door, he saw the bodies of his beloved wife and his youngest son. They appeared pale with the great loss of blood, the young child clasped desperately in his mother's arms as she had apparently done all within her power to protect him. Near the back door lay the bodies of his two older sons, who despite their youth had apparently also fought to the last while wounded and bleeding profusely. Both were covered in blood and freshly scalped. Just as Turner had taken in this horrific sight, the Comanche came back, dismounting and walking idly towards the cabin, presumably unaware of Turner's return. Blind with rage and grief, 
and not fearing for his own life with the loss of all he had held dear, Turner instantaneously sprung from the door, placing a lead ball from his already loaded hunting rifle into the heart of one of the approaching Comanche, killing him instantly. Then, drawing his large hunting knife from his belt, Turner, in his own words, rushed upon the balance like a tiger. Still shocked that the cabin was no longer empty and at the sudden death of their cohort, the Comanche were in a momentary disarray. This afforded Turner enough time to inflict mortal wounds on several of them as they attempted to flee back to their mounts. The ensuing few minutes, by Turner's later account, were a blur. Like a rabid animal, he slashed and cut at any moving body he could until being felled by a volley of shots from Comanche rifles. He lay on the ground, yards away from his dearly departed family, his own blood draining into the dirt. The warriors, at this point unsure if there would be any more unexpectedly returning Texians, decided to take their bounty of foodstuffs and flesh and disappear into the rolling hills and elm tree thickets. Turner lay on the floor of his cabin, unconscious from the loss of blood, coming into consciousness only for brief, presumably traumatic bouts. At some point during that afternoon, a neighbor passing by the Turner farm noticed it was uncharacteristically quiet for a family of three young boys and industrious, fastidious parents. Seeing fit to further investigate, the kindly neighbor was met with the same macabre scene that had greeted Jeff Turner only hours before, only now with several additionally grievously mutilated bodies. According to the neighbor's later account, Turner was found lying across the body of one of his Comanche attackers, with his hands around the warrior's throat and the other hand stiffly grasping the knife that he had driven between the warrior's ribs all the way to the hilt. Nearby lay three more warriors, all with horrific wounds inflicted by the knife now buried in their comrade. Amidst what must have been not only a psychologically traumatizing situation, but a viscerally revolting one, the neighbors saw the faintest signs of life in Turner and, through much effort on his own part, managed to pull Turner out of the cabin, drape him across his horse, and get the nearly dead man back to his own homestead. Here, he tended to Turner's wounds with the help of his own family and other neighbors. Upon initial examination, most among them thought it to be but a matter of time. Jeff Turner did not succumb to his wounds. For weeks, he was plagued by fever dreams and great pains throughout the whole of his beleaguered body. With time and great care, though, the staunch but pitiable frontiersman made his way back to physical health. But the man's mind had been forever scarred. He found the memories too much to bear, an interaction with anyone not privy to his grief far too exhaustive an endeavor to participate in for long. Instead, he had taken to living alone in the wilds of central Texas. He abandoned all notions of family and farming and set his sights on his life's new, sole purpose, revenge. For years, Turner spent every waking moment tracking parties of Comanche deep into their own territories. Turner would initiate a one-man campaign of terror and violence that would hound the Comanche and garner him renown amongst settlers of the area. Still, even amongst the settlers grateful for his undertakings, there was a pervasive underlying attitude of both pity for and fear of the clearly traumatized and now openly homicidal lone frontiersman. Though his exploits had continued to build his formidable and frightening reputation, Turner remained a deeply troubled man. Every night since he had regained some measure of cogency, he had spent pondering the same question he pondered now, several years later, at his camp on the Chicolete Creek. Was it better to fall asleep or to be kept awake by the memories? He still had no answer. The next day, Turner makes his way towards a nearby settlement in hopes of garnering himself some supplies. He dreads the trip, not only for the distance, but for the interactions it will undoubtedly require. However, on this day, the settlement is a buzz. A group of Texas Rangers, the still young but already notorious law enforcement slash military group, have just walked into town. They walked because that morning, 
all of their horses had been stolen by raiding Comanche. These rangers have come into town footbound, angry, and, of course, slightly embarrassed. They are set on procuring themselves new horses and then promptly heading out to exact their revenge on the offending Comanche. They are in luck as a fresh remuda of horses has just been brought into the settlement by a local rancher. The rancher tells the rangers that they can have any horse that they like from his herd in order to give chase to the Comanche. And after 15 minutes of cautiously saddling and mounting the barely broke animals, the rangers were on the trail of the raiding party that had stolen their horses and agreed for their collective pride. Among this group of young rangers is the 23-year-old rookie William Alexander Anderson Wallace, better known to history as Bigfoot Wallace. Though he will go on to a legendary career with the rangers, the young man is a relative neophyte to combat with the Comanche at this time. He leads this party, but is notably nervous and unsure. He is all too aware of the dangers posed by this chase and all but devoid of any experience. As his mind churns through the machinations of tracking and trailing the elusive raiding party, he hears the barely perceptible plotting of a rider trailing them from not far away. Momentarily, all of the young rangers brace for an attack. Then, seemingly simultaneously, they all holster their weapons and exchange unsure glances as the figure of Jeff Turner approaches, mounted on his raw-boned and ill-tempered horse. Though all are inexperienced in combat with the Comanche, these young men have all led combative, adventurous lives in which they had seen many of the more colorful characters the frontier had to offer. But none of them have seen anything quite like Jeff Turner. Bigfoot Wallace gives his personal account in this excerpt from The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace by John C. Duvall, link to purchase in the description. The account is as follows. I saw a man riding up rapidly on our trail. When he got to where I was, he reined in his horse, evidently intending to wait for me, and I had a chance of observing as curious a specimen as I ever saw before in any country. He was a tall, spare-built chap, dressed in buckskin hunting shirt and leggings, with a coonskin cap on, a long, old-fashioned flint and steel Kentucky rifle on his shoulder, and a tomahawk and scalping knife stuck in his belt. His hair was matted together and hung around his neck in great uncombed swaths. His eyes peered out from among it as bright as a couple of mesquite coals. I have seen all sorts of eyes, of panthers, wolves, catamounts, leopards, and Mexican lions, but I never saw eyes that glittered and flashed and advanced about like those in that man's head. Bigfoot Wallace asks Turner if he is a stranger in these parts. Turner informs him tersely that he is not only not a stranger, but that he knows every watering hole between their present location and the Rio Grande. Wallace asks the man if he is not afraid to travel alone in such dangerous territory, over such a wide expanse of country. Quoting again from Wallace's personal account, he grinned sort of a sickly smile, and his fingers clutched the handle of his tomahawk, and his eyes danced a perfect jig in his head. No, he answered, the Indians are more afraid of me than I am of them. If they knew I was waylaying a particular trail, they would go 40 miles out of their way to give me a wide berth. But the trouble is, they never know where to find me. And besides, the best horse this side of the Brazos can't come along old Pepper Pod when I want him to work in the lead. With this, Jeff Turner put spurs to his mount, causing the animal to rear up in a maneuver Wallace determined would have thrown all but the most skillful of horsemen. Turner informs the rangers that his family had been murdered by the Comanche a decade earlier, and that he now spends his time in pursuit of perpetual retribution. As he recalls the murder of his wife and young children, his eyes grow even wilder. His hands begin to shake, and his manner becomes agitated to that of a man on the proverbial edge. He tells the rangers that he has 46 Comanche scalps hanging from the walls of his lodge on Chicolete Creek, and that he intends to add far more. To what must have been a mixed reaction of reluctance and relief, Turner offers his services to the novice rangers in tracking and killing the Comanche raiding party. Though many of the rangers are unnerved by the man's mannerisms, they agree 
that his skill set and experience could provide quite helpful, even vital, assistance in their task at hand. And so it was that the man known as Jeff Turner the Indian Hater came to ride with the vaunted and venerable Texas Ranger legend Bigfoot Wallace. The party would immediately head west, with Turner's tracking skills proving invaluable in the succeeding few days. After much hard riding, they would eventually come upon the camp of raiding Comanche. Here, many of the rangers would see their first taste of combat, and Jeff Turner would forever solidify his reputation as a vicious fighter and a deeply troubled man. Wallace would go on to an illustrious career with the rangers, and Turner would eventually meet his fate at the hands of his hated enemy, dying a hard death in a hard land. South Texas, 1840. A group of Texas Rangers are in hot pursuit of a raiding party of Comanches. The Comanche have been running rampant over the territory for years, killing, kidnapping, and stealing from both Mexican settlers and Anglo-Texans alike. However, this particular Comanche raiding party has aggrieved these Rangers more personally than the rest. These young Texans have received a wound to their pride. The evening prior, they had neared a small farming village known as the Zumwalt Settlement. After a hard day's patrol in the territory in search of any Comanche raiding parties, they had decided that, being in such close proximity to the settlement, they would be in no danger of encountering any Comanche. The young rangers had made camp, eaten heartily, and settled down for a restful night, expecting to rise bright and early and make their way into the settlement. They were, in fact, so sure of their immunity from the Comanche that they had not bothered to stake down their horses, a practice seen as standard operating procedure when operating on the frontier. This presumption had cost them dearly, when they woke to find their horses gone and themselves stranded, still miles from town. They had walked into the Zumwalt settlement with their saddles slung over their shoulders, sheepish, indignant, and set on revenge. They had managed to procure fresh mounts from a local rancher, and had spent the remainder of the day tracking the Comanche who were now in possession of their horses. These rangers, though a group of about a dozen, are representative of the rangers as a whole. They are all young and hungry for combat. However, at this point in 1840, very few of them have much, if any, relevant combat experience against the Comanche. This is no small factor, and one that weighs heavily on the minds of the young Texans. The reality of what fighting the Comanche will entail has become all too stark with the advent of the raiding party making off with their horses. If they were able to get close enough to steal their horses, the young men fairly reasoned, they would have been close enough to have been able to kill all of the rangers outright. Even in 1840, in the early stages of Texans and Americans beginning their efforts to wrest Texas from the Comanche, the tales of the horrific fates that have befallen those who met their ends at the hands of the Comanche are well known to nearly everyone in the territory. The Comanche have, in the last century and a half, conquered vast swaths of Texas via hard, brutal warfare. For centuries prior, the Comanche had existed as an offshoot of the Shoshone tribe eking out a living as hunter-gatherers in the northern Rockies. They had long been the perpetual whipping boy for the tribes that surrounded them, but everything had changed for the Comanche when, at some point during the 17th century, they had first encountered the horse. Initially brought to the New World by the Spanish, horses had at first been a tightly guarded commodity. Their utility for use in transportation and warfare were obvious to even the most cursory observer, and thus, the methods used in breeding, training, and caring for the animals were viewed as a technology that the natives must never be privy to. However, the Spanish idea of keeping horses to themselves had quite literally gone up in smoke with the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. The Pueblo Revolt, also known as Pope's Rebellion, had seen the much aggrieved Puebloan people rise up against the Spanish officials as well as the Catholic authorities in the area. The governor was beheaded, 
over 400 Spanish citizens were killed, churches were burned to the ground, and thousands of horses, those not taken by the Pueblos themselves, escaped under the vast expanses of the northern New Mexico plains. Though many tribes such as the Apache, Navajo, and Utes had made contact with and adopted the horse into their culture as both a means of transportation and a food source, it was the Comanche who had fostered a truly paradigm-shifting relationship with the animal. They quickly mastered riding, hunting, warfare, and even selective breeding. And with the advent of their new technology and lifestyle, the Comanche had ascended from an incessantly downtrodden tribe to a highly mobile and highly motivated war machine. Their lives centered around the vast herds of buffalo, whom they drew nearly all of their resources from. The fight for the buffalo's most plentiful roaming grounds in the southern plain, which comprised the area from present-day Kansas to Texas, had been a ruthless affair. Texas had initially belonged to the Apache, but over decades of brutal raiding and seemingly systematic elimination, the Comanche had overtaken the vast majority of the most bountiful hunting grounds. By the 1840s, virtually the entirety of the southern plains was under Comanche control. The Comanche had no patience for intruders on their hard-won new lands, and viewed the Texans as an especially irascible lot. The Texans, just as the Spanish and Mexicans before them, seek to take what the Comanches believe to be rightfully theirs. In retaliation for their transgressions in venturing into their lands and reaping its many bounties, the Comanche have killed countless settlers, men, women, and children, via unmentionably torturous methods. These stories have spread like wildfire through Texas settlements, causing equal parts terror and outrage. This group of young rangers have all heard the stories, many times over. For many, the promise of avenging these atrocities had been a driving factor in making their decision to venture out here onto the bleeding edge of the frontier in the first place. However, now, the prospect of becoming the subject of one of these unfortunate recollections begins to eat away at their psyches. They are led by the 23-year-old William Alexander Anderson Wallace. Wallace, known as Bigfoot Wallace, would go on to become a legendary and notorious ranger who is recognized today as a seminal figure in Texas history. However, on this day, he is an unsure rookie whose short tenure as commander has already been marred by the shame of allowing the Comanche to get away with their mounts. Wallace is intent on finding and engaging the Comanche, but unsure on exactly how to accomplish either of these goals. Luckily for Wallace and for the rest of these young men, they have been joined by an unexpected visitor earlier in the day. While they themselves adhere to no formalized grooming or dress standards, often wearing anything that pleased them from buckskin leggings to cotton shirts to sombreros, this addition to their party stands out to even the most cursory of observers. He is several years older than the rest of the group in his late thirties, and he is clad in a buckskin shirt and leggings that look to have not been taken off nor washed since the day he first put them on. The man wears a coonskin cap that looks no more maintained than the rest of his attire and carries a relatively antiquated Kentucky rifle and single-shot pistol. He sits astride a large, skittish, raw-boned horse he calls Pepper Pod. The horse seems ill at ease with saddle and bridle, though unwavering in his obedience to his master. In the man's belt are tucked a scalpel-sharp tomahawk and a knife, whose handle is stained with rust-like sprinklings of dried blood. But perhaps the most striking and unsettling feature of the man now riding with this small group of young rangers are his eyes. Bigfoot Wallace, in his biography, The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace, linked to purchase in the description, gives the following account. I have seen eyes of all sorts, of panthers, wolves, catamounts, leopards, and Mexican lions, but I never saw eyes that glittered and flashed and danced about like those in that man's head. Only this morning, this group of young men and this mysterious stranger had not known each other at all. The rangers had, in fact, been alarmed when the man had first approached, as his appearance and demeanor were not readily identifiable as friendly. But the man, who had introduced himself as Jeff Turner, 
has thus far proven invaluable. He had recounted for Wallace the tragic murder of his wife and three sons at the hands of the Comanche and offered to assist the rangers in their quest for vengeance. His sole purpose in life, he insists, is now to track down and kill all the Comanche he can until he is killed himself. He now lives alone in a small camp on a creek north of Victoria, Texas. On the walls of his tent hang 42 Comanche scalps. Turner says he hopes to bring that total to 100 someday. Sensing the young ranger's inexperience in trailing and engaging the formidable lords of the Southern Plains, Turner insists that he has just the rare set of skills and experience that the rangers are in need of. Again quoting from The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace, Turner told the rangers that, I know every water and hole between here and the Rio Grande, and I will go any way these Indians go. I will travel on the freshest Indian trail I come across. You and your company may get tired and quit this trail without overtaking the Indians, but I shall stick to it until I get a scalp or two to take back with me to my camp. The rangers have continued on trailing the Comanche under Turner's guidance since late in the morning, and as the Texas sun bore down upon them, they rode in silence, eyes locked down towards the ground, searching for signs of the raiding party. Again, quoting from Bigfoot Wallace's account. We soon discovered that he knew more about following a trail than all of us put together, and from this time on, we let him take the lead, and followed him wherever he went. Sometimes, where the ground was very hard and rocky, and the Indians had scattered, he would hesitate for a while as to the course to pursue, but in a moment or so he was all right again, and off at such a rate that we were compelled to travel at a full trot to keep up with him. Suddenly, just as the last vestiges of daylight begin to fade, Turner abruptly brings his mount to a halt. The rangers, who have spent the bulk of the day now watching Turner's every move in anticipation of finding the Comanche's tracks, quickly conglomerate behind him, sensing their quarry is near. Turner tells the young, inexperienced men, who could now easily become a liability should they lose their nerves or discipline, to keep an eye out for the Comanche sentries and to keep completely quiet. For the neophyte rangers, the hour is now at hand. They have now implicitly pledged their allegiance and obedience to a man who, only hours before, they had thought to be a local derelict and outright crazy person. Turner and the Texans proceed cautiously, keeping eyes peeled and ears open for any signs of the Comanche encampment. After traveling about 300 yards, they come into view of the camp, situated about a quarter of a mile to their right. With daylight quickly fading, and intent on not losing the advantage of surprise, the party puts spurs to their horses and attacks immediately. For better or worse, these young men's first taste of combat will come without affording them the luxury of forethought. Turner and the rangers thunder toward the Comanche, where the warriors had made a cold camp and were just preparing to hunker down for the evening. The Comanche do not notice the oncoming charge until the Texans, with Turner out front, are roughly 50 yards from their position. This, however, still affords them enough time to take up their guns, bows, and arrows and fire an initial retaliatory volley into the oncoming attackers. The Texans, with Turner out front, dismount from their horses and unleash an initial volley of their own from their rifles. Bigfoot Wallace gives his account of the first moments of the battle. Just as I sprang from the saddle to the ground, a big Indian stepped from behind a post oak tree and drew an arrow upon me that looked to me as long as a barber's pole. I jumped behind another tree as spry as a city clerk in a dry goods store when a parcel of women come around shopping. This dexterous move saves Wallace from a grisly demise as the arrow zips just past his head, taking a strip of bark off the tree he hides behind. Now gripped more by mortal fear than righteous indignance, Wallace attempts to retaliate with a shot from his rifle. But the young man's nerves are so shaken, he cannot steady his aim long enough to make an accurate shot, and misses the Comanche warrior entirely. The fight rages on for nearly 20 minutes, with hand-to-hand -hand fighting and close-quarters combat raging amidst the thick brush and fading sunlight. As Wallace and his cohorts do their best to comport themselves as reputably as possible, they look to Turner for inspiration and instruction. However, Turner gives no commands, and his actions cause the young rangers 
more shock than awe. Nearly oblivious to the actions of his fellow Texans, Turner moves coolly and methodically towards the Comanche, firing, reloading, and moving, all with a wild look of equal parts bloodlust and jubilation in his eyes. Wallace gives his own account of Turner's actions during the attack. I noticed my friend Jeff several times during the fight, and each time he was engaged in lifting the hair from the head of an Indian that either he or someone else had shot. They say that practice makes perfect, and it was astonishing to see how quickly Jeff would take off an Indian's scalp and load his rifle in readiness for another. One slash from his butcher knife and a sudden jerk, and the bloody scalp was soon dangling from his belt. At the same time, he never seemed to be in a hurry but was as cool and deliberate about everything he did as a carpenter when he is working by the day and not by the job. When the Indians began to retreat, one of them jumped on one of our horses, which they had tied hard and fast to post oaks near the camp, forgetting in his hurry to unfasten the rope. Round and round the tree he went until he wound himself up to the body when, just at that instant, Jeff plugged him with a half-ounce bullet and had his scalp off before he was done kicking. As darkness begins to take over the landscape, the Comanche mount a retreat into the vastness of the Texas wilderness. Still unsure of the Comanche motives, though, the rangers gather in a tight circle and begin to load their rifles as fast as their fatigued minds and digits will allow. Suddenly, a Comanche war cry pierces the air as a gunshot simultaneously rings out. Just as suddenly, a member of the Texan's party left unnamed in Wallace's account but described as a tall, scant chap, falls to the ground, clasping his hands to his face. Boys, I am a dead man, the young Texan cries out. With Turner still preoccupied in finishing off and scalping any remaining warriors he could, the rangers scan the chaparral brush in the dusk light and notice a Comanche lying prone in the grass some thirty yards away. The warrior is clearly in the throes of dying from his own wound. Wallace himself had seen the Comanche fall during the fight and presumed him to be dead. But, in his last moments, the warrior had risen up and fired a shot at the Texans and collapsed again. Moments later, he is gone, still clasping tightly to his weapon. According to Wallace's account, upon later examination, the warrior would be found to have suffered a total of seven bullet wounds before expiring. However, before any such examination can be made, Jeff Turner appears as if out of nowhere, covered in blood and knife in hand. He deftly separates the dead Comanche from his scalp, piercing a hole in the trophy and stringing it onto his belt before moving on. Despite all of the violence and gore, this seems to the young rangers to be the only time they have seen any measure of peace in Turner's otherwise perpetually tortured demeanor. Luckily for the young ranger who had been hit, his wound is mostly superficial, with a bullet having just grazed his head. Though shaken and with a slight gash on his head, he is otherwise unhurt. After the fight, and after securing a sizable portion of their stolen mounts, the rangers afforded themselves the luxury of a fire and a hot meal, and they were soon joined by the now placated Turner. As the exhausted Texans all gather around a freshly built campfire and recount the events of the day, their collective mood begins to relax. One of the young men recounts, with no lack of self-effacing humor, his inability to distinguish between fauna and foe, which caused him to repeatedly fire his rifle into a tree stump, thinking it to be a charging Comanche warrior. Most in the group find the story amusing, but Turner, in his momentary lapse from his normal demeanor, actually laughs out loud. The volume and veracity of his laughter surprises the younger men and even seems to catch Turner himself off guard. But, as Wallace would later recall, either the unusual sound of his own laugh frightened him, or else he had used up all of his stock on hand, for I never saw him crack a smile afterwards. Turner quickly recedes back into his normally morose demeanor, as the weight of reality once again seems to crash down upon his withered psyche. His eyes seem lost again, perhaps momentarily reliving flashes of his tragic past. After a brief rest and a quick meal, the Texans prepare to ride back to the Zumwalt settlement. However, once they reach the Zumwalt settlement, Turner bids the party a brief and unremarkable farewell, and returns to his camp 
with his fresh scalps still dangling from his belt. Wallace's recollection is as follows. I was told when I was at that settlement several years after this that he had stayed around there for a good while, occasionally coming into the settlement for his supplies of ammunition, etc., and always bringing with him four or five scalps. Wallace would go on to serve his legendary career with the Rangers, living to the age of 82, finally passing away in 1899. He would claim in his memoirs to have no real knowledge of Turner's ultimate fate. However, this notion would be contested by a personal friend of Wallace's who, in the 1930s, would recall for a writer what Bigfoot Wallace had revealed to him about Turner's actual fate. El Paso, Texas, December 1932. Legendary Texas author and journalist Frank J. Doby sits in his hotel room, impatiently glancing at the door every few minutes. He has spent a restless afternoon reviewing his notes and readying himself to receive a well-known guest he has long waited to interview. Finally, in the early evening, a knock comes at the hotel room door. Doby opens the door and is greeted with the imposing frame and genteel smile of the legendary Texas cowboy he has heard so much about, yet never met. The man's name is Frank Collinson. He is an Englishman by birth, having come to Texas from his beloved homeland in 1872, when he was only 17 years old. He has spent the vast majority of his time since then living the hard, solitary, dangerous existence of a working cowboy on the Texas frontier. He is also, though, a lifelong reader and a man with a profound proclivity for intellectual pursuits such as philosophy, science, and writing. Doby and Collinson shake hands and exchange pleasantries as Doby welcomes the elderly man into his room and out of the December chill. Doby, already a noted authority on the history of Texas and the American Southwest, has sought Collinson out with the hopes of solving a mystery that he himself has been unable to answer despite years of research and investigation. After settling into a chair, Collinson, well aware of Doby's reputation and record, wastes little time broaching the subject of Texas history and regional legends. Collinson asks whether or not Doby ever got a chance to meet the legendary Texas Ranger William Bigfoot Wallace. Doby responds that, regrettably, he never had the chance to meet the iconic Ranger face to face. But, he adds, he is well aware of his exploits. With this, Collinson leans into the lamplight, locking eyes with Doby, a serious expression now drawn across his face. Did you ever hear of Jeff Turner, the Indian hater, he inquires. Yes, replies Doby, suddenly feeling unnerved, as if he is caught in an impromptu inquisition meant to suss out whether or not he is indeed worthy of the information now stored only within the confines of Collinson's memory. I have read about him in Duvall's book on Bigfoot Wallace, referring to the 1871 publication written by John C. Duvall entitled The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace. Apparently satisfied, a knowing smile spreads across Collinson's face, and a sorrowful look takes hold of his eyes as his mind is momentarily lost in the glory and gore of days now long gone. Does the book tell what became of Jeff Turner, he asks. No, and I have often wondered, replies Toby, now situated unconsciously on the very edge of his hotel seat, already ensconced in the story about to be told. Well, Bigfoot told me, Collinson opines, and then, as Doby sits enthralled, begins to tell the tale of what actually happened to the legendary Texas wild man. Turner had come to Texas with his wife and children in the 1830s and settled on a plot of land on the Guadalupe River. For a time, the family had thrived on their small plot of land in the bucolic rolling hill country of central Texas. However, tragedy had struck one morning after Turner had gone out hunting alone. Texas was, at the time, one of the most dangerous locations on earth. This was due to one predominant factor above all others, that of the mighty Comanche nation. The Comanche had ruled over this land for the better part of two centuries and were feared by virtually all. Though more of a cohesive unit of bands than a cultural monolith, by the 1840s, the Comanche oversaw a veritable empire that spanned from southern Kansas to northern Mexico, as far west as Colorado, and as far east as the burgeoning city of Dallas, Texas. 
they have risen to prominence via decades of brutal raiding and warfare that saw countless men, women, and children fall to Comanche lances, arrows, and tomahawks. Time and again, until their eventual capitulation and confinement to the reservation system in the 1870s, Comanche war parties would strike in brutal raids against any and all who occupied even the fringes of their territories. Whether the victims were Mexican settlers, Tonkawan villagers, or Texan farmers, the standard operating procedure for a Comanche raid would routinely see all fighting age males killed in horrific ways. Infants, often dispatched, and women and children summarily kidnapped and abused. Oftentimes, whole families would simply be slaughtered, scalped, and left where they had fallen. Such had been the case for the terribly unfortunate Turner family. Jeff Turner had scarcely left his homestead more than half an hour before he heard the blood-curdling sounds of his wife and three boys under attack by the Comanche. Turner had sprinted back, only to find his wife and children's lifeless forms strewn about their cabin. When the attacking Comanche returned to finish him off, he had inflicted so much damage that, after believing they had mortally wounded him, the Comanches fled, leaving him for dead. But Turner had not died. He had survived, but his psyche had been irreparably scarred. After recovering for several months under the care of charitable neighbors, Turner would move to a small camp on Chickaloth Creek, north of Victoria, Texas. His life from then on would revolve solely around exacting his revenge on the Comanche for the murder of his beloved family. He would head out alone, atop his trusted horse, a volatile jet-black Mustang named Pepper Pod, following any Comanche trail he could find in the whole of South Texas. He would pursue the Comanche at any opportunity, ambushing them individually, on the trail, or in watering holes. He would dispatch them with his lengthy hunting knife, scalp them, and cure the gruesome trophies inside his tent on Chickaloth Creek. For the next few years, Turner would appear sporadically at the Zumwalt settlement near present-day Seguin, Texas, in order to procure basic goods and sundries. Though he kept mostly to himself, his eyes would glitter and his demeanor would become as animated as a vaudevillian actor when describing the intricacies of his macabre favorite pastime. It was these eyes and odd mannerisms that had so unnerved Bigfoot Wallace and his ranger company when they had crossed paths with Turner in 1840. Wallace and his cohorts had been in pursuit of Comanche horse thieves in South Texas when Turner had appeared seemingly out of thin air and offered to guide them through the country he knew so well. Though the party of young rangers were at first dubious as to how much help this seemingly derelict man would be, it would be less than a day later when Turner would prove his merit as both a tracker and a fighter. The party not only recouped their horses in a small but violent skirmish in South Texas, but all were witness to Turner's monomaniacal fury in battle against the Comanche. As they made their way back to the Zumwalt settlement, it was Turner alone whose belt was adorned with several freshly taken Comanche scalps. Wallace had been profoundly impacted by his interactions with Turner, being taken aback both by his story of personal tragedy, as well as the frightening intensity of his desire for revenge. But, after his company had moved on from the Zumwalt settlement area, Bigfoot was left with only anecdotes and speculation as to the ultimate fate of the local legend, Jeff Turner. These he had passed along to Collinson. Neither had been included in Duval's account, as they were thought too gruesome for the sensibilities of its Victorian readership. In the first of these accounts, Turner is finally caught sleeping by the Comanche, in a remote South Texas cold camp in the middle of the night. He is well known among the entirety of the Comanche tribe as a near feral and wildly vicious white man who had scalped many of their people. He is also, though, regarded as a man with a fierce fighting heart. This, even as an enemy combatant, made him useful to the Comanche. In the theological worldview of the Comanche, there is no singular great spirit to be worshipped. Instead, they believe there to be a universal medicine or power, known as Puha, that the Comanche believe to reside in all natural things, from rocks to buffalo. In Turner's case, it is his heart that is believed to hold great power. Thus, once Turner is confined as a Comanche prisoner, he is treated even more harshly than most. Turner is bound and brought to the camp of a major chief within the band. 
he is dragged to the door of the chief's lodge, inside which resides the chief along with his pregnant wife. The morning sun has not long hung in the Texas sky, but already its repressive heat has begun to exact its toll on the already battered and bedraggled prisoner. The flap which serves as the door of the teepee suddenly swings open, and out steps an imposing middle-aged man, whose face is creased from both the withering of time and his scarcely concealable rage. The chief closely examines the features and stature of this hated Taibo, the Comanche's name for the whites. As the warriors surrounding the chief and Turner taunt and sneer at their captive, the chief motions for them to commence with the ritual at hand. Turner is thrown to the ground, where he is beaten and clubbed further still, as the lashings that bind his hands are undone and four warriors grab him. Turner is held down as each of his arms and legs are tethered to wooden stakes buried deep into the hard ground. Turner, for his part, remains silent, though perpetually wide-eyed throughout, as the taunts and insults are hurled at him from assembled villagers and blows continue to rain down upon him at varying intervals from warriors who had been so long aggrieved by his antics, it is possible that Turner's thoughts turn to his late wife and children. Then, as if on cue, the assembled Comanche villagers and warriors go silent. The chief now walks over to the door of his lodge and again swings it open. Except this time, his wife emerges from the cavernous darkness inside. She is slightly younger than the chief, possessive of a dignified, natural beauty, and in the latter stages of pregnancy. She is ritually adorned in paint and feathers, and, instead of the perpetual disdain that contorts her husband's face, her expression is one of placid indifference. She is brought forth towards Turner's position by two female handlers, and sat down perhaps a yard away from the increasingly unnerved Texan, whose breathing rate is beginning to increase by the second. As the sun begins its final ascension towards its noontime apex, the brutal ceremony at hand reaches its climax. The chief brandishes a large hunting knife meant for the butchering of buffalo. For an agonizing few minutes, Turner is taunted with up-close shows of the frightful blade and mock attacks. Finally, Turner is cruelly dismembered at the hands of the Comanche chief, with his heart being removed and then served to his wife, who consumes it in the belief that it will make their unborn child strong and brave. Turner's remains are unceremoniously disposed of, and he is never seen again in the Zumwalt settlement. In the second version of Turner's demise, Turner is said to have been briefly paired with a like-minded frontiersman named Smokey, who shares Turner's penchant and proclivity for collecting Comanche scalps. One day, as they are ranging around the Texas hill country, the duo come upon a family being attacked by a Comanche raiding party. Turner and Smokey are able to draw the attention and ire of the raiding party who give up their raid on the family and pursue the two men after the pair shot down two of the Comanche warriors from a distance. Turner and Smokey then flee into what proves to be a box canyon, a natural, steeply walled enclosure with no way out save for the way the two men had come in. With the sun sinking and darkness rapidly approaching, the men are able to find a small cave, about as wide in circumference as a wooden barrel, into which they crawl one after the other. After crawling back into the cave a few yards, the tunnel opens up slightly so that the men can inch along in a crouched position. They advance further into the cave, seeking to put as much distance between themselves and their Comanche pursuers as possible. Turner takes the lead as the men move forward at a torturously slow pace, in total darkness. Suddenly, the unmistakable sound of a rattlesnake's rattle whirs out within the tight confines of the cave. Both men stop instantly. Turner has a book of Mexican wax matches in his pocket. He retrieves one and strikes it, illuminating a truly nightmarish scene. No more than ten feet away from the men is a writhing mass of diamondback rattlesnakes, with some branching off and slithering closer towards them while others flee deeper into the cave. With no better solution, both men hold their crouched positions, motionless. Minutes drag by, with the men fearful that any move will draw a strike from one of the venomous creatures. Suddenly, though, Turner's leg spasms, forcing him to shift his weight ever so slightly. But this adjustment, however minute, is still enough to draw the attention of one of the increasingly agitated diamondbacks. The animal strikes Turner, 
sealing his fate. Smokey, whispers the terrified Turner. I've lifted my last scalp. With the Comanche prowling outside, an attempted escape is an implausible option. All Smokey can do is stay with his friend as Turner expires. Within a short time, Turner begins to twist and contort, limited only by the confines of the earthen walls. He then begins to hallucinate. He grabs Smokey's arm and confides in a hushed, panicked tone. Look, there's a hole in the ground right in front of me. It's the skylight to hell, and I wonder why the devil left it uncovered. Then, in the words of Frank J. Doby's own account of the event titled Between the Comanche and the Rattlesnake, an extravagant seize that would have satisfied any exhorter holding a center over brimstone furnaces, he described his own advance into the torture of heat and power of hellish beings. By the time the sun rises again, Turner's body is cold in death. The rattlesnake horde has rescinded further into the cave while the Comanche war party has moved on. Smokey does his best to respectfully inter Turner's remains in a makeshift grave near Fort Phantom Hill near present-day Abilene, Texas. Though we can never be fully sure of exactly how the legendary Jeff Turner the Indian hater lost his life, it is safe to say that he likely expired the same way that he had lived, ensnared in a noxious cycle of violence and anger. And while Turner's legend certainly stands out, as he is even known by many elderly residents of Texas to this day, the tragedy and torment that so unfortunately encapsulated his life are not at all unique in the experience of the Old West, and in Texas in particular. The tales of violence, vengeance, and retribution carried out upon and at the behest of the Comanche, the Texans, the Mexicans, the Apache, the Tonkawa, the Karankawa, the Kiowa, and the Spanish and Texas's long and storied history are, to be sure, too numerous to cover in one episode. Rest assured that we will certainly do our best to cover these important events in as much depth and breadth as possible, but for tonight, they are other stories for other times. Thank you for joining us on this episode of History at the OK Corral. Be sure to click the like button, share this episode with a friend, and become a subscriber. Also, if you'd like to support our work and gain early access to episodes, as well as ad-free viewing, you can become a member of this channel by clicking the Join button or click the link in the description below to become a member on Patreon. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.